Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on creating a legacy through charitable giving. And uh, today we are very pleased to be joined by Karen Hudson. And uh, today we're also very pleased to introduce to you Leah Zeidman, who, as you know, is our uh, marketing coordinator. And Leah is going to take it away from here. And uh, Eric, Jeff, and I will be in the background with questions and uh, and handling your your uh, your questions and and uh, comments. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, welcome everyone, and uh, to future viewers when this eventually gets hosted on YouTube later, um, welcome to you as well. We're happy to have Karen Hudson on uh, to discuss this today. Uh, we're just going to give a few minutes or uh, 10, 20 seconds for people to get on. Uh, this is a live webinar, uh, so if anyone has any questions as they come in, as they listen, maybe something pops up as we go along, uh, please feel free to put in the chat. Uh, we also have a Q&A section that you can pop it in there, uh, either with your name or anonymously. It's your choice. We'll do our best to answer as we go along. Uh, and if you have any questions later, we're happy to get them too. Uh, we'll have our emails and contact information up later. Uh, and Karen uh, will be accessible as well. So please feel free to reach out if you're interested in anything we're talking about today, but maybe you have the question pop up later. I've certainly had that happen before. So without further ado, let's move forward because we do have a set of disclaimers that we do need to have on the screen for 10 to 20 seconds. So while we do that, this is hosted by the WWH Financial Group team. Uh, all who's on the call today, uh, including Darren, our newest teammate. Uh, he'll be joining us as an audience member, but we hope to introduce you all more formally soon enough. We're very happy to have him here as well. I believe that should be a good 10, 20 seconds. So I'm gonna move forward. And as for the rest of us, uh, you see us up on the, the Zoom video, hopefully, but here are all our portraits here. Uh, Jeff, Pear, Eric, and myself. Uh, between all of us, over 50 years of combined financial markets experience, and uh, hopefully they'll come through today. And let's move forward to Karen, who we're very happy to have as well. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing everything you have to offer on this today. Thanks, Leah. And hello, everyone here today. And those of you that will be watching this in the future, I am excited to be joining you. Okay, so my name is Karen Hudson, and I'm the VP of Growth at Benefaction Foundation. And again, so pleased to be joining all of you today. So who is Benefaction? We are a national charitable public foundation, and our mission is to encourage philanthropy by helping affluent Canadians, families, business owners maximize your charitable giving, while minimizing your tax and administrative burdens. And we do that through the use of donor advised funds, essentially making it easy to add charitable giving to your overall wealth management plan. So we'll start with a really quick what, uh, you know, what are donor advised funds? And then we'll move quickly into the why, because everything starts with the why. That's what, that's what we know. So a, a donor advised fund, or I will use the term DAF for short, a, a DAF is a charitable investment account held at an independent public charity like Benefaction Foundation. Um, a DAF receives donations from one or many individuals in, in, in corporations, and we issue a tax receipt in return. Donors can name their fund, um, and then the fund part is issuing the grants to charities over your lifetime and beyond. We will, we will get into a much more detailed description, but just really wanted to start there with that, with that basic concept. Um, some people like to think of it as like having your own charitable foundation, but without the accompanying cost and administration that goes along with that. Um, I do think it's important to mention that donor advice funds are the fastest uh, charitable giving vehicle in Canada. So thank you for joining today's conversation to learn more about them. So now on to the why. Um, everything starts with the why. The reality is that your motivation for establishing a donor advice fund will be will be very personal, um, but we do see some consistent uh, reasons. What we have on screen here is uh, some research done in the U.S. Um, a number of years back, but the, the facts still hold true. 
Um, so starting at the top of the list, investment growth of charitable assets, the assets held in your donor advised fund are invested with your recommended investment advisor, that person you know and trust. And so they continue to grow over time uh, to meet your charitable purposes. Better organizing and keeping a record of my giving. Simple things like you, you receive one tax receipt when you establish your fund or, or when you make an additional top-up donation instead of every time you're making a grant out to charity. So come tax time, you don't need to be amassing uh, multiple uh, charitable tax receipts uh, to pass on to your accountant or, or perhaps you, you do your taxes yourself. The third point, giving me time to decide where to give. This is a really interesting one. You know, a lot of people um, might experience a significant taxable event. So we were joking earlier at the start of this call about winning the lottery or, you know, whether you, you sell a business or you receive an inheritance and you have this tax situation that you need to deal with um, within that tax year, which sometimes can be, you know, very close away. But you know that you want to use these funds for charitable purposes. You just don't have the, you know, the time and the capacity to really think through that charitable giving plan. So what you can do is in establishing your DAF, you, you make that donation, deal with the taxable event, and then you have your lifetime and beyond to think about where you want to give. So you're really separating the giving from the taxable event. That's a really uh, key aspect of DAFs. Uh, sustaining my giving through retirement. Um, you know, the reality is that during retirement, income drops, and so out of your day-to-day -day income, it, it can be more difficult to kind of sustain that level of giving that you had during your working career. And so by establishing the DEF, or donor advice fund during uh, the period of your life where you're working, then you have this ongoing pool uh, of dollars that can, can keep your giving uh, going while you're in those retirement years. Uh, the fifth point around creating a charitable legacy that in particular, I, I would be interested to see this research uh, recreated after these past few pandemic years. A lot of people are really thinking about how do I want to be remembered? What is the legacy that I want to leave in my name, in my family's name, my business's name? And so donor advice funds are a, a great way to do that. You know, you can continue to add to it over time. And one of the, the nicest features of it is that you can name it whatever you want. It can be in your family's name and the name of a loved one who's passed on and really kind of carrying that name on into the future. Uh, six point building funds for a large future gift. You know, some people like to almost like that's where I said at the outset, it's almost like a charitable uh, savings account where you can continue to add to it year over year if you wish and then sort of building uh, that capacity to make a, a larger future gift down the road. Maybe the organization you're supporting has a plan 10 years down the road um, for an exciting project that you want to be a part of. Uh, you can use your donor advice fund to, to build the funds for that. And then the final point, but uh, not the least important, uh, bringing families together around giving. You know, we have a lot of great examples about how families use the donor advice fund to engage multiple generations in in giving and we have a wonderful or a few examples like this at benefaction where you know the grandparents have established the fund in their family name and then they engage their children and grandchildren and one example each family member gets a certain amount at their birthday time of year that they are allowed to choose a charity of their choice to grant out and the, and the grandkids have to make a presentation to granny and granddad on who they want to support and 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 they really are teaching those lessons about generosity and giving through all of the generations of their family. And so it's a, a beautiful example of how donor advice funds can bring a family together around giving. So there's always, you know, why or what motivates people to initially uh, sort of think about a donor advice fund. Um, but I'd be, be remiss not to point out some of the very specific uh, benefits of, of using a donor advice fund as a charitable giving of choice. Um, there are certainly tax savings uh, to be realized. So when you uh, establish your fund and make that donation, you do receive a, a donation receipt that can be used to offset um, your income and taxes payable in that, in that tax year. Also, when you donate securities, and I'll talk about this a little bit earlier, the, the tax liability that's associated with the uh, capital gains is significantly reduced. And so there are certain ways that you can give that are more tax advantageous than others. The second point about efficiency, at the end of the day, 
um, all of the uh, administration work is taken care of for you. So if uh, something you're considering in your family is maybe a, a family foundation, a donor advice fund can be an interesting alternative that doesn't have all of the costs and complexity associated with, uh, with running your own private foundation. The third benefit, control. Um, with benefaction and our model, you advise, the, the, the donor on the fund advises on the charities you would like to support, and we make grants each year on your behalf. You also get to recommend uh, the financial advisor that you would like having uh, manage the assets in your fund, and so you can continue to work with that uh, trusted advisor uh, like Pear and Eric and Jeff. They can continue to work uh, with you on your charitable assets. And the fourth point about legacy, we can't um, bring this point home enough around how donor advised funds really can be used uh, to create that legacy in your name and you can continue to add to it over time and you know invite family and friends to get involved and, and, and even use your estate uh, to further fund your your donor advised fund and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So if you're thinking, you know, does this seem like me? Do I, you know, do I fit uh, with kind of a typical donor who might use a donor advice fund? And I'll, I'll mention a few attributes here. This is from another research study um, specifically uh, done in Canada. The first point, family focused, many donor advice fund holders. I touched on the concept of, you know, multi-generational earlier. Uh, there are a lot of people that want to establish that that uh, multi-generational approach to managing their charitable giving, establishing that legacy. And so the donor uh, typically has family in mind. With that said, we have lots of donors that are, are single individuals and just you know find themselves in a position where a donor advice fund meets their needs for other reasons. It's typically affluent individuals that open donor advice funds. I mean, if you think of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, anyone needs to have kind of those basic needs taken care of um, before they can start thinking about things like charitable giving. So it's uh, typically um, affluent individuals and their families. The third point, often a lump sum recipient, meaning um, you've come into some funds, whether it's an inheritance, that lottery example again, um, selling your business. The first point, uh, planned finances. So quite often uh, folks that would uh, gravitate towards using a donor advice fund is someone who takes a very planned approach to managing their finances and also managing their char charitable giving. And maybe they have sort of a tax sensitive um, approach to how they manage their finances. That's another common attribute. And the fifth point, and perhaps the most important is uh, those that gravitate to using a donor advice fund are already active in the charitable uh, sector, philanthropic, uh, you know, whether that's as a financial supporter or a volunteer. Donor advice funds are never used purely for the tax uh, advantages. It's really about um, that charitable intent and philanthropic approach uh, to life and, uh, and then some of these other attributes that I've mentioned already. So perhaps something on this screen resonates for you and you think that that sounds like me. We I've touched a little bit on the, the concept of these sort of taxable events um, and why they might lead to establishing a donor advised fund or, or making another sort of major gift to a charity directly. There are certainly some personal events that can occur perhaps uh, you're retiring and so you're starting to have conversations with your advisor around what that means for your finances and your financial planning, estate planning, loss of a loved one is often a time when people think about, um, you know, thinking about that person, what kind of legacy can they create in the name of that person, that's often a, a key motivating factor and inheritance, again, these sort of uh, moments in life where there is a, uh, a lump sum of funds that are received. There is some truth, though, to the fact that um, major donations can, you know, be driven by uh, those significant taxable events that someone is facing. Uh, so that's maybe the sale of a business, you have some stock options that are vesting, a sale of a property, a deemed a possession on, on something in your portfolio, you know, when a transaction is going to uh, generate a significant tax liability, donations, whether that's a donor advice fund or directly to a charity, um, a donation can you know, help to dramatically reduce that tax bill. And, um, and so that 
can often be a, a motivating factor for, for our donors. So I've touched quite a bit there on the why and, 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 and the team today really felt that was the most important place to start this conversation. So if any of the points that I've raised kind of resonate for you that, okay, that why makes sense to me, this, this sounds like me, then, you know, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll jump in now into the how, you know, how does a donor advise fund work? So it starts with the gift. So you make a donation, to benefaction to establish your fund, to the minimum uh, donation or the minimum ongoing fund size is $25,000. You fill out a donor agreement with benefaction. It's, it's short, it's about four pages long, uh, but this is where you get to think about how do I want to name my fund? Is it in the name of my family, my personal name? Is it in the name of a loved one, my business? So you get to name your fund. You also uh, do things like identifying your successors. So what that means is, you know, once you are no longer able to manage your fund, if you would like it to, to live on in perpetuity beyond your lifetime, you can identify a successor to continue that legacy in your name. So maybe it's a family member. Um, and for those that don't have a, a natural sort of person in their life to take on that responsibility, the directors of benefaction, our board can take on that role for you. So during your lifetime, you would leave instructions with us on how you want your fund to be managed, and we would act as your successors, or rather our board would act as your successors. So when you're first establishing the fund, you make your donation, and we'll talk a little bit in a moment about the types of assets that you can donate to establish the fund, and you receive that tax receipt from benefaction. So if you make a $25,000 donation, you get a, a tax receipt for $25,000. That donation is then invested by benefaction into an individual account that is associated with your donor advised fund. Our investment policy statement really has an objective of long-term capital growth. Um, I think it is uh, worth mentioning that the assets, because benefaction is a, a registered charity, the assets in the account grow tax-free which is a nice benefit, and, uh, and our, our investment policy leans towards a balanced portfolio. So you've made your gift, the assets continue to grow, and then granting, that's really the exciting part. Um, so each year, a portion of your funds balance is granted out to Canadian charities each year. Um, at the moment, the, uh, the minimum amount is 3.5% of the average value of the fund, but I will mention that that is increasing uh, to 5% starting in January of 2023. That was uh, a motion in the 2022 budget. So from benefactions perspective, we're excited about that change. Our donors in aggregate, we grant out close to 20% every year. So you know, where we have no concerns with that increase to 5% and, and, and always encourage our, our donors to be, to be generous. So when it comes down to granting, you let us know your instruction, you can send us an email, you can fill out a form. We have a, a donor, an online donor portal you can use. You let us know which charities you want to support and in which amount we make that grant on your behalf and then confer, confirm back to you when that grant has been made. So that's how it works. We like to simplify it into gift, grow, grant. And just adding a little bit more detail on each of those areas, gifting. So what kind of gifts are accepted? So cash is, is the most straightforward, though probably um, has the least incremental tax advantages um, you know, when, when using that, beyond, of course, the donation tax receipt. Publicly traded securities, I'll, I'll share an example of that in a moment, as it is a particularly tax advantageous uh, way, way to give. Um, for any business owners uh, on the line today or in the future, uh, Benefaction does accept private company shares. So there's, of course, a process for valuation, um, but it is an interesting opportunity for, for people that find themselves in that situation. Uh, registered assets, whether it's from your RSP, your RIF, your, your tax-free savings account, those types of assets can be donated to your benefaction fund. Life insurance, there's a, a number of different ways to structure life insurance gifts to benefaction or other charities, so that can be an interesting option to explore with your, with your advisor. And lastly, estate donations. We have a number of donors who, you know, give to their fund during their lifetime, but then they actually embedded in their will is a bequest uh, to their benefaction donor advice funds so they can 
top up the value of the fund um, upon their passing. And then the fund continues to make grants out uh, in their name beyond their lifetime. So we, we do see a lot of those estate donations being made. So just jumping into that example uh, of the tax advantage of a donation of securities, the easiest way to kind of demonstrate this is to compare the scenario where a donor uh, sells the, the, the appreciated securities and donates cash versus donating the securities in kind to the charity. And, and to confirm, I'm talking about publicly listed securities, not private shares, though I will say there is a movement um, and some lobbying to have the similar tracks treatment uh, applied to gifts of private company shares and also real estate. But for now, this is uh, publicly listed securities. So I'll walk you through an example of Susan in Manitoba. She has a security position with a fair market value of $100,000 that cost her $10,000 years back. So she now has a $90,000 capital gain. She wants to donate this $100,000 to uh, the charity of her choice. Yeah, uh, some simple math here. If you have a ninety thousand dollar capital gain, uh, fifty percent of that, or forty five thousand dollars, would be taxable at uh, Susan's marginal tax rate of forty six point four percent. She's looking at a tax bill of twenty thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars. So almost, you know, over twenty percent of that hundred thousand dollar gift that that she wants to make to the charity. If those uh, if that, those securities, rather than selling and donating them, if they're donated in kind to the charity, like Benefaction or another charity, then that uh, capital gains tax is eliminated. So Susan is able to make that same hundred thousand dollar gift, but at uh, you know at a lower cost to herself, which at the end of the day, you know, might encourage her to then take that tax that she saved and make another gift to charity. So it's a win win situation that. The Canadian government, uh, this is one area where we do have a favorable uh, tax system in particular around the treatment of donation of securities. So moving on from that initial gift, we'll talk about the grow piece. Don't want to get too deep on investments here, but I think what's you know important to mention is that you know the assets in the donor advice fund are um, invested on behalf of the donors in accordance with benefactions investment policy statement. The objective of, of our investing approach really is to generate an investment return that, you know, to the extent possible, protects the, we'll call it purchasing power of that initial donation made into the fund so that it grows enough to cover that required annual disbursement and also any expenses associated with the fund. We, we achieve this through the use of a balanced portfolio. Our target asset mix is on the screen there. You can see um, our target is 10% in cash, 30% in fixed income, and then 60% in equities with uh, a larger weighting to Canadian and U.S. equities. I think, um, you know, the key point here is really that, again, the assets in the donor advice fund are being managed by your trusted investment advisor um, in, in coordination with Benefaction. And moving on to the final piece, going a little deeper on the granting area. So we often get the question, well, who can I grant to from my donor advice fund? Um, and the answer is any, any registered care charity in Canada, of which there are you know, close to 100,000 across the country. So any registered charity that can issue. So any registered charity. Sorry, just working on getting myself unmuted here. So uh, you can uh, grant to any uh, registered charity or qualified donee across the country. And um, really any organization that is able to issue a tax receipt can receive a grant from Benefaction. And what does this all cost? So there are fees associated with managing the account. Um, uh, you know, I think the first point to mention is that all of the fees are, are taken directly from the account. So there are no out-of-pocket costs that are, um, you know, at the expense of the donor. So that's the, the first point to mention. 
Um, so there are, uh, we start with the donation fees. So when the account is first established or a donation is made, there is a 1% donation fee if there are accumulated, accumulated, accumulated donations up to $1 million. Um, between $1 million and $2 million, uh, the fee is a half a percent or 50 basis points. Uh, it's 35 basis points between two and three million and negotiable thereafter. So we've got the donation fee, which is a one-time fee. The ongoing administration fee is uh, a half a percent on the first million dollars in assets in the fund. And then it, uh, it it goes down from there. So it's 35 million or 35 basis points on the next million. And then 15 uh, after that, 15 basis points. The administration fee is calculated and charged quarterly in arrears. And again, that's just debited directly from the investment account. And then the, the third fee to consider are the investment fees. And those will depend on the investment selected and the advisor, but could range anywhere from as low as a half a percent to one and a half percent. We've shared some examples on the screen here. So you can see, depending on the size of the account, uh, what that donation fee might be, the administration fee and the investment fee. And you can see kind of year one versus year two, how the fees would change with year one being higher because of that initial donation fee. What do you expect from benefaction? So when you when you open an account or, or a fund with benefaction, you, you do have a relationship with us directly. There are certain communications that we will send to you, but you, you may also choose to maintain your relationship with, with us through your advisor. So some common communications that we'll send is we'll have a welcome kit when you first when you first open your fund with us. We'll, we'll send you tax receipts whenever you're making um, uh, donations into your fund. Whenever you're making a grant out of your fund, we'll send you a grant confirmation just to reconfirm to you the amount and to whom. And, and, and then there are quarterly statements that you'll receive by email. We do also have a donor uh, portal, an, an online portal that's been launched earlier this year, where if you prefer to kind of operate online, you can pull the information online, make your grant recommendations online. And then really the key point to reinforce is you can communicate with Benefaction via your advisor if that's preferred, or you can communicate with us directly via email, that online portal or the phone. So that concludes the formal remarks um, in terms of the information that I wanted to share. There's some information on screen here about benefaction if, if, if you ever wanted to reach us directly, um, but certainly um, with uh, Per and Eric and, and Leah and Jeff, um, you know, we're happy to, to, to be introduced there. So I will stop sharing my screen at this point and, and open it back up to uh, the other folks on the line here. Well, thanks, Karen. That was great. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions that I'm sure uh, everybody else does too. Um, so just if you could go over, um, so again, the minimum amount to start up a fund, it's $25,000. And that's going to generate an instant $25,000 um, tax receipt for you, right? That's right. And, and additionally, we can use um, securities if we wanted to instead of cash. So if we That's have right. a, a mutual fund that let's say gone up 25%, normally you'd have to pay tax on that. But can we use that for the, the donation as well? Yes, absolutely. So whether it's the initial funding of, of the new donor advice fund or a subsequent donation over time, um, donations of you know an appreciated mutual fund or, or um, can be donated to the account. And then to your point, Per, you would um, you would avoid any capital gains tax uh, on that donation. So it's a particularly tax advantageous way to go. Right. And so that's the key point there is that when you make that donation, let's say it was worth $75 and now it's worth $100 just for simple mm -hmm. math. You don't, you normally, if you sold that, you have to pay tax on the gain. But in this case, because you're making a donation, you don't have to pay the tax on the gain. So you avoid that and you get the full $100 tax receipt, which is really- That's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of, there's a double tax advantage in that scenario. There's the donation receipt for the amount of the donation, the, the $100, and then the the elimination of the capital gains tax on the 
on the $25 gain that you would, you would otherwise pay if, if it were not donated. Okay, and then when I've set up my fund, so now I've set up my fund and now it's year two and I want to put some more money into it. Mm -hmm. What are the what are the minimums that we can what what's so, the minimum we have to put in after that? Yeah, so we don't we don't have minimums for ongoing donations. I mean, an amount below $50, we don't issue a tax receipt. Many, many charities are the same. Um, but your subsequent donations, as long as we're maintaining a, a balance in the account of that $25,000 minimum. You can you can add to it over time, and we do find actually that um, the, the core donors on the fund will actually engage family members. So you know, a, a family member can can add. So you can have we call them third party donors. You know, it doesn't have to just be the name donors on the fund. You can actually we can accept donations to your fund uh, on your behalf, and then that third party, of course, would receive the associated tax receipt. So like my donation. my neighbor. My yeah, neighbor. your neighbor for sure. Sure. We do have some funds set up in memoriam, you know, um, someone in the neighborhood, you know, someone passes away and so that neighbor rallies, the neighborhood rallies together and they kind of create this fund in the name of that individual. It's, um, yeah, those are some of the, the ways the funds can be used. Yeah. Uh, if, if I can uh, uh, add a couple of points, I, you know, for those families that have set this up, um, I think the structure uh, is is so much better than the ad hoc way we tend to uh, manage our donations now. Uh, you know, certainly over COVID uh, years, you find you lose track of the charities that you were donating to, or you know the amounts and the and 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 this is a really nice way of um, deciding well in advance, or even you know you know once every year which charities you want to continue to support and how much the funds are already there. Um, and the allocation goes out on a yearly basis. Uh, it's also, you know, if you want to sensitize, you know, your family or your children uh, to to the the process and and the benefits of doing this, you can have a family meeting uh, once a year, and they all bring in their ideas for charities that they want to, you know, that sort of thing. You can create more of a uh, an awareness and a, and and a, and an opportunity for the family to get together and discuss these things, which is which is a nice nice way to uh, to meet. So there are some side benefits, certainly structure and organization, and and especially if you're having a a big tax year for for whatever reason, a windfall or whatever, uh, those are good years to set this thing up. If I may add, just build on some of Jeff's comments there. So a couple of things you made me think about. So for people that are supporting the same organizations year over year, you can actually set up standing grants. So you don't even have to remember who you're giving to and in what amount. We we literally have that in our system and it's done automatically on your behalf and then you get confirmation each year when it's done. So it kind of takes all of that paperwork off of your plate. And absolutely, uh, Jeff, you know, it's interesting after weekends like Thanksgiving weekend, we always hear from our donors because they've gathered as a family, they've thought about where they want to give, and we have kind of an intrusive request. So that's just one example where the family comes together and they kind of have those conversations about who they want to support. And, you know, the, the other thing is it takes away that sense of guilt when you go to the supermarket and they ask if you want to put in another dollar or two for whatever charity they happen to be supporting. You go, well, we're covered. We yeah. really are covered. Yeah. yeah. Have that plan in place. Any other questions from the group? Uh, I think we'll monitor. We'll see if anything comes through. I did want to ask if you have if you have any success stories that you can share with it. Go into all the details, uh, but uh, maybe of a, a family or a group that set this up, and uh, maybe some of the positive impacts. Are there any uh, feel good stories that you can share in that regard, Karen? Yeah, for sure. So I'll I'll think of one in mind. Um, there was a family that had sold a business and they were sort of dealing with that event in, in several millions of dollars. And then at the same time, the, the patriarch of the family died. And so this family had, they were, they were, I mean, there was a lot coming at them in this one year. They, they were selling this business that was, you know, in the family for years, the father dies and, and they know it's, it's that example of just, allowing the charitable giving to happen later they just had to deal with what they needed to deal with emotionally and financially in year one and then the following year because in the first year it's open you don't have to make any grants 
So they, they could deal with what they needed to. And then the following year, about midway through the year, when they were ready to start having those conversations about who do we want to support? And then they came together and, and it truly was uh, the mother, uh, the son and daughter and their spouses kind of sitting around a table and talking about, and they have named uh, the fund after a particular tree that the father was, you know, loved uh, to see in their garden. And so, you know, that even the name of the fund in, in his memory. And so they're just a really lovely story about how, you know, we could take a burden off their plate in a really difficult year. And, and then now they're, they're experiencing the joy of their fund and the giving. Um, another example, I touched on it briefly earlier, but, um, you know, there's a gentleman I've known for a number of years who, who opened a fund with us and, and quite literally, you know, there's kind of 10 family members across three generations and they each get a certain amount on their birthday and on their birthday, they, the, the grandkids, and he shared like a PowerPoint presentation he created to educate the grandchildren on giving and, and how donor advice funds work. And then the, the grandkids will submit via grandpa their, their grant recommendation. And when we send the letter to the charity associated uh, with that grant, we use the grandchild's name. So they know that it's coming um, from that young man or that young woman that's chosen that organization to support. So we can do, um, and, and that's another point actually, when you're making grants to charities, you can advise us on, on how you want to be recognized to that charity. So we have some uh, donors who are, are deeply private and they want to remain anonymous. I'll say though, single digits in terms of percentage of people that do that. Most people want to be named with their gifts, but it is an option to remain, remain anonymous. Um, or we can share the name of your fund. We can share full name and address details. So there's flexibility there in terms of how you want to be recognized for your gift, which is another feature that, uh, that people really like. So anyways, Eric, there's two examples kind of that you know, that uh, legacy of, of the patriarch of the family, and then just another family that's taken a really fun approach to how they're managing it through through their generations. Right. Karen, awesome. can you um, pull up, I don't know if that's possible, Leah would know, uh, the slide of, of the charities that you you uh, can support in, um, you know, as a Canadian. And I know, you know, the, you know, the, the, some of our donors might have charities uh, outside the country and the States and whatnot. Um, and and there was some uh, one box that talked about them ha having to be accredited or uh, approved. Mm. And, and so how how do you go about uh, determining whether a charity is valid or not? Hey, great question, Jeff. So this is the who we can issue grant slide that I that I covered quickly. So the I guess the the, the key distinguishing factor is. Any organization that's supported through your donor advice fund needs to be an organization that in its own right can issue yeah. a tax receipt. Okay. So the reason being the donors received a tax receipt from benefaction from their donation. So anyone they support has to be um, a, a, a an organization that can issue a tax receipt. Okay. At so the end of the have, day, they a, yeah, sorry? they have a, they're a numbered charity with the Canadian government sort of thing. That's right. So uh, CRA maintains a website where you can search by name, number, um, and there's close to 100,000 registered charities in Canada, but many of them are doing work abroad, Jeff. So people who have um, causes overseas that are important to them, there is often a charity in Canada that is doing that work and can right. be supported through the fund. Um, and then there's a number of organizations that are called qualified donees that are also able to be uh, granted from the benefaction fund. And so examples of that are um, municipalities, universities outside of Canada. So if your alma mater is in the UK or the US, you can support that organization through your donor advice fund. Um, mm -hmm. So whenever a, a donor puts in a request to us, sometimes we can see right away it's a common organization, but if not, we'll do a little bit of research. And if for any reason, we can't support that organization. We let the donor know and, and give some suggestions on maybe a similar organization um, that they might want to consider. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. What's a what's a listed charity outside of Canada? That's an interesting one. Uh, so there are. Oh, I was thinking that's the. So there are certain organizations. If um, if the. Uh, the government has supported that organization, then it's included 
in the list. So there's a list of certain organizations that are included because I, I guess it's because they've been vetted otherwise. Um, they've already been sort of pre-vetted. So they are considered a qualified donee that can uh, that can receive that can receive a grant. A lot of amateur athletic associations, but not all of them. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll be clear on that. You know, there are certain ones. And you might you might have heard the term nonprofit. A nonprofit is different from different from a registered charity or qualified donee. Uh, the difference being that nonprofits are not able to issue a tax receipt. So if you have a local Sometimes a local sports team, your, your, your kid's soccer club might be a nonprofit, but yeah. they're not a registered charity, so you could not support them through your fund. But would like speed skating, uh, we, speed skating Canada or Skate Canada or, or, or something? Yes, like, often soccer, those soccer kinds can, of... Canada soccer, those would be usually... Typically okay. they are. Yeah, those kinds of organizations. Um, with, you know, we have people supporting Olympic athletes, uh, various uh, various organizations like that. So when you're well, so if I wanted to support through my found my um, benefaction account, if I wanted to support an Olympic athlete, I would go through the amateur athletic association, I guess, and then yeah, it it depends the on who they're associated uh, with. Yeah, we would do a little bit of research. So there are some where other press will come into our team and our grants administration team. We always try to find a way, you know, there's often um, kind of um, organizations that can accept a donation and then and then uh, transfer the funds on. An example is like Toronto District School Board, I'm based in Toronto, TDSB is a registered charity, so they can accept a donation and then uh, transfer those funds to a specific school that uh, the donor wants to support. So there's often sort of intermediary organizations um, our, our philosophy is let's find a way to make this work and we, we research around and try to find someone that will accept the grant if for any reason hmm. it's not a registered charity. So, I mean, but I mean, really, the initial receipt is uh, issued by benefaction. So the tax slips are, are irrelevant uh, once once you've made the initial deposits. Right. Uh, by the same token, if you, you know, you happen to deposit, uh, you know, Amazon shares and and they're sitting in the account and they go up, they double, um, you don't get a donation receipt for the growth on that. You, 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 it's a one time in and then the growth is something you can distribute, but you're, you, you know, obviously all the growth uh, stays with, uh, with your uh, charity uh, foundation, right? That's right. The growth stays in the account, but it's non-taxable no. because it's, right. with, uh, it's the, the holder of the account is a registered charity. So yeah. that's the benefit. It is non-taxable. Um, but you're right, uh, Jeff, on the point that, and that's sort of one of the advantages, you get that one tax receipt, and every time you're granting out, you're not getting all these tax receipts, you need to keep track of and manage. So right. that's the the administrative burden that's kind of taken care of. Gotcha. That, that actually raises an interesting question. So let's say I donate, um, like Jeff said, some Amazon shares. Um, what happens to those shares when I donate them to Benefaction? So they are donated. Uh, so the key is to make the donation in kind to not yeah. sell them before. So then that's the, how we avoid the capital gains tax. And then uh, the shares are liquidated. So depending on the position, oh. so there there is typically an approved uh, list of investments. It's quite quite a range um, that you can choose from to hold in the account that aligns with our investment policy statement. So mm -hmm. the so the shares are liquidated. Um, and this is where I wish I had our chief investment officer on the line, but there's there's a time period, whether it's the literally by end of business on the day they're donated or within a very short time period, sure. uh, they need to be liquidated. And yeah. then uh, then the proceeds are reinvested in investments from that uh, from the recommended approval list. Oh, OK, so so OK, so. But you ideally you're donating something that's already gone up. So mm -hmm. yes, so that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. So you're looking to sell it to kind of lock in that um, that price. That you know that's again, it's often those appreciated securities. We did some analysis on it this year. I think seventy percent of the assets that are donated this year are appreciated um, publicly listed securities. Wow, fascinating. So mm -hmm. one other question. So if someone wanted to go through and see the list of approved. Canadian amateur athletic associations to see mm -hmm. which ones you know you could donate to. What what website would we go to, or is there or is there a website you can send me and I can forward it on to them? Yeah, absolutely. So CRA maintains um, various sites of what they 
considered to be a qualified domain. So that is maintained by the Canada Revenue Agency and benefaction kind of follows in accordance with what they've outlined. So depending, um, so any uh, profic proficient Google searchers out there can find it with, you know, list of qualified domains and kind of link your way down. We frankly, that's what, what we do in our team. You know, we look at, because it can, you know, it be updated with some frequency. So we're always looking at most up-to-date information. Another um, resource I'll give a, a, a shout out to uh, Canada Helps is an, an online, is an organization that manages a lot of online donations, but they have a wonderful search engine on their website. So if you're saying, I, I want to support education and I want to do it locally in my province of Ontario, you can put all of these kind of filters on and it'll help you kind of search charities that are doing work in an area that's of interest to you. Um, we also have resources on our website. We have a blog post, you know, how do I choose a charity to support? What are the things I should be thinking about? So we have uh, resources around that that kind of point you to various websites so we can share that with you, um, Pair, and then you'll have that on hand uh, for any of your clients. And your, your, your colleague already shared the list of yep. uh, amateur athletic associations in the, in the Q&A there. Oh, uh, wonderful. Yeah. Jolie, it's very... Uh, Thank you, Jolie. Very responsive. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. That's classic teamwork at Benefaction. Yeah. There you go. Well, very efficient. As 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 we've, uh, hopefully, our clients have come to expect, expect we bring them the best and the brightest. Glad to hear. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for questions, eh, Per and Eric? I think I've I've exhausted the list of questions that I had, which was which yeah. was great. A lot of it was answered in the webinar, which is wonderful. Yeah. For the right person or the right opportunity, this makes a lot of sense. Not for everybody, but definitely what we want to try and do is highlight um, the opportunities to create charitable legacies. And whether it's through benefaction or otherwise, there's there's lots of opportunity. And I know uh, Jeff, Eric, and I and the team are very are very focused on that. So, yeah. Thank you. Excellent. And we're happy to partner with you on those opportunities um, when they make sense. But you're right. There's lots of ways that you can support um, the charities of your choice donor advice funds are one solution that that work in in many scenarios uh, but not all and, mm -hmm. and and we keep our lines of communication open and, and welcome any uh questions that that arise out of uh, out of the conversation today fantastic no that's great well on behalf of the team karen and uh and jolie in the in, in the background there uh, I'd like to to thank you all uh, for joining us and sharing uh, what benefaction can do and and how it can benefit um, you know people with it who are charitably minded mm -hmm. and um, and I guess I'm going to wish everybody to have a nice day. It's sunny here. I don't know what it's going to be like in the future when you're watching this video, but uh, everybody have an awesome day and all the best. Okay. Thank you for the invite. Thanks, Karen. That was wonderful. Bye, okay, yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you.